Hi, thank, thanks for coming. Hi, this is the 295th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. It's a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and other work using text and image. It's sponsored now in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. Our guest tonight is Uli Lust. She was born in Vienna, moved to Berlin in 1995, where she studied graphic design. Her published work includes comic journalism, uh, featuring observations on fashion, Berlin nightclubs, and other aspects of modern life. Uh, her graphic novel, Today is the Last Day of the Rest of Your Life, of 2009 was translated into 10 languages and won an Ignatz Award, an LA Times Award for Best Graphic Novel, was nominated for an Eisner Award, and also won the Prix de la Révélation at the Angoulême Comics Festival. Uh, Voices in the Dark, an adaptation of the novel by Marcel a buyer was released in 2013. Her latest autobiographical graphic novel, When I Try to Be a Good Person, was on the shortlist for the Golden Fove at the Comics Festival in Angoulême in 2018. Uh, since 2013, she's been a professor of comics and illustration at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Hanover. And she was also the founder of Electro Comics, one of the first publishers of screen-based comics, which is, I guess it's still going. Yeah. And she's here to talk about her old and new work. So welcome, Uli Lust, take it away. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> I want to share. You can share your screen. I can right. share my screen now. Yes. So, hello, everybody. Um, what I will do today is a lecture of uh, the two autobiographic books, a short story, and I will also show some of the drawings which I'm doing now and um, talk about it. Um, my English is, let's say it's basic, and I'm sorry for my accent. I hope you get more the Werner Herzog vibe than the Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, you know, I'm also from content wise, I feel more near to Werner Herzog. I am very concentrated on like a documentary drawing or real life drawing, um, but I see the observations of the contemporary life more as a jumping board or like as a, a, a visual metaphor for a lot of uh, questions which I want to raise about humans and how we live and together and how we behave and all this stuff in general. Um, to illustrate what I'm talking about, I want to read, I want to start with a short story which is a little bit older. Oops, uh -huh. I have to make it here. Oh, it goes, yeah. And it is. it was published in a Swiss magazine uh, called Strapazin. It's a very good old uh, German comic magazine, which does um, a lot of experimental comics too. And this is a essayistic comic. The essayistic storytelling is something which I'm very interested in the moment. And this is like a preview, an old story. Play, pretend. During my childhood, I was careful with every step I took to only step to step only into the center of the patterns. Just don't step on the gaps. In the short of amount of time it takes for the cement to dry, a child had managed to walk through it. I imagine it giggled and was mischievously happy to have left its track behind. It's probably long grown up by now. 3.7 million years ago, old footprints were discovered in Tanzania. 
two pre-humans of different sizes had walked through damp ashes. So, and now only for you exclusively, this is a photo of the original footstep. It is fascinating that you have uh, this one moment of two people walking through wet ashes and it was dried by the sun and then a new ash rain covered it up. And we still can imagine people walking here. They had stopped in the middle of their tracks, turned to look west and then trudged on. A second ash rain covered and preserved their tracks. Come on, let's keep going. Oh man, why are we just standing here? Let's keep going. Come on, come on, come on already. What kind of terror are you causing here? So here's some illustrations of prehistoric humans, homos. You are a terrorist. It is considered common knowledge among today biologists that humans viewed as animals are born too early. Oops. The reason for that is the long growth phase of its large brain, because our brains are very big, they need a lot of energy and a lot of time to grow much more than small brains of other animals. So the Carrying the fetus to the first point of the maturity would exceed the holding capacity of any womb. It, its brain grows very quickly while in the womb until birth. After that, there is a delay in the development. So this here is a quote from Joseph Campbell, Masks of God. Uh, in the course of its genus history, the morphology of Homo sapiens grew increasingly. similar in form of those in form to those of our closest relatives, the Pongwits, geats, some of which are specifically considered to be childlike. That includes our hairlessness, our small teeth, the oversized head, the position of the torso and a few behavioral traits. Children's curiosity and playfulness, which has completely disappeared from the essential nature of adult chimpanzees, but can remain a human trait until well into old age. This is something to be discussed, I would say. But it's a site, it's a quote from Jan Huizinga, I think. Please train the board. Stand clear of the closing doors. So what do we have here? We have here a strange man in the top subway. Please note that smoking is not allowed in train stations and subways. Next stop, Klosterstraße, exit on the left. Hmm, what is that noise? The behavioral scientist Konrad Lorenz claimed all scientific knowledge to which we owe our world dominating role arose from playful activities in the open field, which were carried out exclusively for the sake of playfulness. What is that? What is going on here? The subway is falling apart on me here. That doesn't sound good. Keep, please keep calm. What? You are laughing. Do you have something to write with? No. The Japanese word asubo refers to playing in general and means relaxation, amusement, passing the time, excursion, recreation, debauchery, throwing a dice, doing nothing, being idle, but also studying at a university with it or with a teacher as well as to wage a mock battle. And finally, to take part in the very strict formalities of a tea ceremony. Here, take this. Now you, going, you are going to write the following. I shall not laugh while the subway is falling apart. There, write it 10 times. I have to attend the subway now. Train to Ruleben. Uh, excuse me, may I take your picture? So this was me. 
Photography is prohibited in traffic. The flash could irritate one of the drivers and provoke an accident. Well, there is no such danger in the subway. Uh, I can take the picture without the flash. All right, then you may proceed. The extraordinary seriousness of the Japanese ideal of life is hidden behind the fiction that it is all just a game. The language still preserves this concept in the Azobase Kotoba, the polite manner of speaking when addressing those of a higher rank. The polite form of you are arriving in Tokyo is you are playing arrival in Tokyo and for I heard that your father has died, it's I heard that your father has played death. So this is also a quote from Jan Huizinger. <coughs> <coughs> He does his job with great seriousness while I play getting off the train. Please board the train. So this was one of the typical Berlin people observations. And um, my nice uh, daughter-in-law, Anita Matkovic, was so nice to translate it for me in a very short time that I can read it here. So I have to thank her for that. Um, I started doing reportage and journalistic drawing and documentary um, comics out of a special interest of somehow using my observations in storytelling. That was the, the start of my comic career in general. I started when I, late when I was 30 and somehow it never got, uh, the, 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 the fiction was never an issue. And when I wanted to do a longer comic, I, remind, I, um, I got reminded to a teenage adventure, which I had experienced and that it might be a very good material for a comic. And so then I, started, I thought, okay, let me do also autobiographic storytelling. It was not really um, my intention in the beginning, but the, the, Documentary storytelling was what I'm super interested. So it's very comfortable if you are the hero of the stories, you don't need to be careful about um, embarrassing someone else or doing talking bad about someone else. It's just your own uh, bad secrets you are uh, um, opening up. So, um, and there was one other thing that on this journey, um, it's it's the journey of two young punk girls which hitchhike to Italy without money. It was like a, this typical thing when you are 17. It happens very often that 17 years old teenagers say that they want to leave home to run away and to, to go south to see the sea or whatever. Uh, mostly they only come to the next gas station or whatever. We were just so lucky to get until Sicily and I was looking for adventure and I got it. So I will read a little bit out of this book now. <laughs> if I read it, the English is already written there. <laughs> Watching can be interesting too. So this is now 1983 and I'm 17 years old. It's the punk era. The others probably think I'm boring because I don't talk a lot. Who is there to talk to? Did you hear me? I said, how about you suck me off? Some things are even too gross for me. Okay, give me, just give me a hand job instead then. She said, no. So what do we have here? It might sound like an offensive scene where these people are having a quite vulgar language, but actually I think it's quite a clean scene because he says what he wants, she says what she thinks about it, he accepts it. It's a totally morally, absolutely uh, okay scene. Sorry, I don't have the vocabulary now. 
All right. Um, now I jump around like 100 pages. Um, there was this one friend, this girl, which wanted to go to Italy. And I thought, yeah, let me come with you. She was 80 and her hobby was sex. Um, and we hitchhiked and the Italian, we, we were very successful um, in hitchhiking in Italy. We always got a, um, a car and a driver and often we also got offered uh, places to stay overnight. Like there was always a free bed for us. I wonder why the following morning they were in a hurry. Frederico was really bummed because you wouldn't sleep with him. Ha! Huh. <clears throat> I didn't believe him. I was so ashamed. I couldn't take my pants off. What? Ah, I look awful. Huh? I shouldn't get undressed. I had an awful night. He kept on pawing at me all night and I didn't dare let him in. Edie, you are crazy. Let's take off. This sucks. So for the ones which don't know the book, what was the problem of this girl? The night before, we discovered that she had lice on her pubic hair. And I knew the wonderful um, way to um, get rid of the lice through shaving her pubic hair. And this girl thought that she doesn't look like a woman anymore if she doesn't have pubic hair. These were the 80s and I love it. She was, a, she was ashamed to show her, her shaved uh, vagina. She didn't want to have sex because she had a shaved vagina. I love this scene. I really love it. Sorry. Okay. So then we, we left the house and didn't forget to take the little coins from the fireplace, which this Italian man had stacked there. They were not really very valuable because Lira were really... Uh, very low in the, I think 500 lira was like one cent or something like that. But it was enough to buy a bathing suit, which I'm wearing here proudly. Uh, we, we were hitchhiking to Italy to actually see the sea. And it was the first time of my life that I saw the sea. And it was not as exciting as we thought. Lying on the beach is boring. Fuck the tourist towns. I want to go into the big city. Rome? Yes, Rome, the eternal city. So the next city we, we, we crossed was Pescara. And it's getting dark. Overnight here is, or keep going. At least Pescara is a city. Let's grab ourselves a bite. Hey, ciao, ragazze. E. Tu, tu, ciao, 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 belle. Hey, people have got it going on. <laughs> ciao. Toot, toot, ciao. Toot. Ciao, Bella. This particular light, we were very careful in seeking out our sleeping quarters. They cooked up a giant batch of spaghetti for, a whole, for the whole gang and taught us the art of preparing perfect pasta. After midnight, he was lying next to me, a dreamily, dreamily attractive pinup boy, the kind who'd never ended up next to me in Austria. Because in Austria, I was like this, this middle, middle type. The, I, my girlfriends were always the pretty ones and I was the nice girlfriend. And I, I got the, the a little bit more uglier boy. So here in Italy, I was suddenly a big bummer and he was crazy about me. I was swept off my feet. Your eyes are beautiful. You are beautiful. Oh. One, two, three. <sighs> so it was very fast. And within just a few seconds, his entire life, and, and he just fell asleep next to me. Within just a few seconds, his entire life unspooled before my eyes. He was going to end up in a proper job, maybe electrician, auto mechanic. He'd get himself a trophy wipe from Pescara. They'd make a lovely couple. And they'd have themselves this boring screw up every night. Later, just on Sundays. 
So we were driving from Pescara to Rome and then um, stayed there some time and it was great. Uh, we met some new friends. We wanted to travel to Palermo. I lost my good friend Edie through a intrigue of a guy who wanted to spend the night with me. Then I, uh, she was going to Palermo already and I knew that I can find her maybe there wherever in Palermo and I looked for a travel companion because I already noticed that it's not that easy to travel as a girl alone in South Italy. The more South we came, the more attraction we were getting. <clears throat> it was um, not that nice anymore. So one must get go of the past, let go of the past and be aware of here of the here and now. Krishnamurti calls it the choiceless awareness. Dita was the ideal travel companion. He wasn't going to annoy me with declarations of love and he spoke German. Palermo, why not? We can pretend we are a married couple. It would be too dangerous for me to by myself. No problem, great. Besides which I know karate. Isn't that illegal to own? So I made a switch now, I switched some pages. What he's referring to is one of these knives which jump out um, when you click a button. I got it as a present from a guy and I was just using it to slice bread. Uh, just so we are clear, I'm a pacifist. Ha, I just use it to slice bread. Yeah, I already said it here. I'd never pull it out in a dangerous situation. I have no idea how to handle it. I'd be much too afraid I'd end up sticking myself with a knife. It was very important for me to draw this scene because in American movies, people always are super competent with weapons. And I don't understand how they do it because if I have a knife in my hand, I, I, it would be too dangerous in a dangerous situation. The, the perpetrator would have it in seconds. I would have no chance. So better don't show any sharp materials in a, a tricky situation that would be my tip or whatever. So he also says very sensible. Oops. And he says to me, your best bet, your best bet is to open your heart chakra and radiate love. So this sentence says that Dita has no idea how it is for a young girl in South Italy because radiating love was what I was actually doing without purpose here, yeah. um, without meaning it. Mediation, medi meditation is fantastic. You should try it. That's all right. I was, I always found the praying in church lame. That's such a balony. This is totally different. Watch me. I sit and embrace the gift of stillness. Your spirit can take flight and seek out places that it ne has never seen before. That's exactly what I'm doing. And I don't have to sit around to do it either. I'm speaking of the quest for enlightenment. You have to turn your gaze inwards. Enlightenment, I can take it or leave it. I'm happy to be outside at last in the real world. For the longest time, I have felt that everything I know, I know only from books. Now I'm finally experiencing something myself. I am doing as I please, not what someone is telling me to do. So what is it what you want to do? Booze, smoke and hang out? You got it. I learned much more the, this past couple of weeks on the road than I have from the, all the books I've read in the last few years. I want to travel, I want to try everything. If I had to sit still, I'd explode with longing. Good Lord. Yeah, with 17, this is how you feel, sorry. I woke up in the middle of the night. The clatter of the wheels had turned into a soft hum. I was gently being rocked. So this was a nice surprise because we were traveling with uh, the trick that we only bought a, a ticket for the first station. Like we entered the train in Rome and these situation where we are on a ship ferry to Sicily must be minimum 10 hours later. 
So this is how we traveled in South Italy in the 80s. You buy a ticket for one station and then the control comes and then they never return again. If they come a second time, then you sleep, but they never came a second time. So we always traveled the long distances with very cheap tickets. We reached Messina without a second ticket control. I changed into a touristy t-shirt and ne Neapolitan style jeans in order not to attract unnecessary attend notion. Hey, hello. Da, da, da. Hello. What's going on? Ciao, ciao ragazzi. Hey, ciao. Come on, keep moving. Sorry, I don't speak Italian. The, peop the way people stares at you makes me a little anxious. You get used to it. Hmm. So these guys were talking with us. Here's a little uh, uh, writing mistake because it would, should be usually we speak Sicilian. They speak a Sicilian dialect. And now they spoke Italian for me that I could understand them with my little Italian knowledge. What did they say? They wanted to invite us to lunch in a house by the beach. Oh, that's nice of them, sure. So the house on the beach was not very glamorous. Food and wine, and so was the food. Roast chickens. I'm a vegetarian. Sorry, I'm vegetarian. My husband no eat meat. We have got bread too. It turned out not to be a big drinking evening. Eventually, I figured out he wanted to show me the house. Look, there is a bed here. We go to bed, then we make love together. No. You out of your mind? My husband outside. Ah, don't worry. He will not hear us. He is going for a walk with my friend. No, I don't want to make love. No. Come on. Yes, make love. Yes. These guys wouldn't take no for an answer. They expected it. A woman who said no was a decent woman. No. It was his mission, mission to persevere, to flatter her and maintain bodily contact until the woman succumbed to his mighty male scent. Dieter, ah, he's on the beach. You're so beautiful. You not heard? I said no. Stop it. Ah. Leave me alone. Don't touch me again. So we have Karate Dita. He was trying to restrain me on the beach. What was all that about? They left early and let us stay overnight in the cabin. Ah, I'm all itchy what I'd give for a dip in the ocean. I'm itching all over, fucking mosquitoes. Uli, we could have sex. Don't you start with that now, fucking shit. I, I thought, I mean, you are a woman, I'm a man, we could. What, some kind of natural law? Yeah, I mean, no. Uh, just pretend I am a man. I'm writhing in pain and this dumb bastard wants to have sex, Jesus Christ. So the next morning on the train from Messina to Catania, next station. So here we have a bag with food, some money and an empty seat. And I think about the last minutes, which just passed. This is where I get off. Right in the middle of the pampa. What are you doing here? Are we doing here?
this is Mount Etna. I would like to meditate on the mountain alone. We need to say goodbye now. What? But we are gonna together. I'm sorry. It's getting too much to be too much for me. Always being stared at scenes like last night. I don't want to go through that again. All this aggressiveness, I can take it. Keep the provisions. Here's 5,000 lire. I need to go. Good luck. I learned that my new, new friends could just up and leave. And now I'm used to it, but that time it was really new to me because I came from the countryside from like a very big family. And uh, when you go on a journey with somebody, you just go on a journey with somebody. You just never just exit the train if you want to. So that was something I learned also. Catania. And now I had to be really prepared. Huh? And the, the, the rules are just simple. Don't look anyone in the eye. Every look is an invitation. Don't return any greeting. Every greeting is a challenge. Don't they have any sense of shame? They did not because they could uh, easily see that I'm a foreigner and that I would be available for them, maybe possibly or whatever. And so what you do as a woman is you look at the, at the floor the whole time because you don't want to attract this attention and you don't want to signalize that you want to have sex with him by looking into his eyes. So you just look on the floor the whole time. And I have to say, it's not the best perspective for it for a traveling and I think it's also not the best perspective for living in general so this dynamic of looking downwards is very bad for women I would say um, maybe I could add that this the same night I got raped and thank you Dieter <laughs> Whoever, wherever you are <laughs> great um, uh, the, the story from that point gets very dramatic and bad, but before I really, um, I thought it was a very joyful uh, event, an event also. I, I don't see this book as a only dramatic um, novel. But the one which I did afterwards, that was a dark one. Uh, that's an adaptation of a book uh, which is part fictional, part non-fiction. Uh, some of the characters are from real life. Uh, one is the, the family of uh, Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister of the Third Reich. So this is a book which is located in the 30s in Germany, in Berlin, and you have during the war, and you have here the eldest daughter of Josef Goebbels, Helga, and this, and this is the family, six children with the mother Magda Goebbels, they were like the glamorous family from the Third Reich, that's why there are a lot of photos from them, and the girl Helga, she was six in the beginning of the book and 14 in the end, she is one of the two narrators. Here's a photo of the family. Here's the real girl. And the second narrator of the book is, uh, is the second voice is a, a sound engineer called Hermann Kano. He's a fictional figure. He was the main figure about whom the author Marcel Bayer wrote the book in the beginning, but then he thought there's something missing. He wanted to add something and he found the Goebbels children to his fictional character. When I read the book, I was more interested in the girls than in this man, but in the end, um, uh, I, he is still a very important aspect of the story. He is fascinated by sound and by the human voice and the, by the recording of human voices and through his scientific experiments and um, also by the war going on, he gets more and more deep into very, very strange experiments, which he always excuses with his very good intentions he has. It's a 
psychological thing which we know very well also and then in uh, the in 45, 1945, he gets called into the bunker to record the last words of the Führer also. And he is also working for Josef Goebbels because so Josef Goebbels was working, he even had a radio recording station in his own house. He was doing a lot of recordings and he met the children and they were somehow friends sometimes. Um, the children in the book are, the, the war is not really shown but you can see the war through the games of the children who play what they see around. They are somehow innocent and they are also shielded in this um, center of the, of the storm, you know, uh, around them, everything is getting destroyed, but they were like, yeah, they were like the, 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 the monarch's family or something like that, but it didn't help them, you know, because the, the story of the Third Reich is one is a good one. The bad guys get punished in the end. I somehow still like <laughs> the story. Uh, I would love that it always works like that. I mean, they had to destroy the whole world, world first, but they destroyed themselves and their children. So uh, the, 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 you, you see the whole story about the last days in the bunker and then it goes on in the 70s, where you meet old Mr. Kano again, and he finds a package with records which re recorded. He was recording the voices of the children in the, in the last week, and then you hear it, and you hear a lot of about theories about the last day, what had, might have happened in the bunker. And even it's possible that Helmut Kano himself was the murderer of the children. So it's not a positive story, absolutely not. <laughs> it's an example of what what happens if if you have these wonderful good ex intentions, whatever. Yeah. After this terrible Nazi story, which was interesting to work on, I wanted to do something more joyful again. Uh, and uh, also, it's another <clears throat> scenario of my life which had some literary potential, let's say so. It shows the life of a 22 year old, like the, I, I see it a little bit as, you know, the girl is a 17 year old and now she's 22 and suddenly I have developed sexual needs and I also have my nice boyfriend. When I was 17, I was not really interested in sex. I just liked kissing and all that romantic stuff. I, my body wasn't really prepared, but later, yes, it was prepared. So I'm here with my nice boyfriend, George, who is an uh, actor, songwriter, singer, and he is 18 years older than me. Uli, we need to talk. About what? I'm worried it is a mistake to talk about it. It is definitely is one, but I want to be honest with you. I don't want to lie to you. Just say it. It's always the same. I'm so sick of it. Marie was my first girlfriend. We were very much in love. She was a great musician, a sensitive, tender woman. Physically, she was exactly my type. Slender, always almost boyish, and despite that, for all those years, we barely slept with each other. It happened less and less and finally stopped entirely. I didn't miss it. We were in many respects a perfect couple. You didn't have sex for years? No, we were hippies. I had affairs and so did she. That wasn't ever a problem between us. Ah, got it. So he was 18 years older than me and he was a teenager exactly when the hippie era started. So free love and all this stuff. So of course, George was in, in was not, um, he was okay with, with, with this arrangement. Well, until she left me for another man.
Since then, I just keep repeating and repeating the same matters. It's like a curse. I meet a woman and fall in love. And as long as we remain unfamiliar, the sex is indescribably intense. A real relationship develops. And as intimacy grows, the erotic animal in me dies. I often ask myself, am I only attracted to unfamiliar women, the woman full of secrets? Or is it actually that she gets to know me better? At the start, I can play the great guy. That's where I am confident. That's where I'm reckless. In the day to day, the small frightened George shows up. And he can't believe that a woman would ever find him desirable. Such bullshit. Yes, I know. I see through myself, but remain trapped there. And now it's happened again. I don't feel it anymore. I don't understand. You don't want to be with me anymore? Luckily, that was not the case. We came to the agreement that we don't have sex for the next time to just not put him under pressure and that he doesn't mind it if I have lovers. <clears throat> what I did not tell him was, that I wasn't that super enthusiastic about our sex life, neither. He was somehow, we were physically not made for each other. I have to say, it happens. Some people are physically not made for each other. You can try whatever you want, and it doesn't really work out. It's, it's something, it has something to do with magic, whatever. So I was quite happy that we didn't have to go through this, uh, that we didn't have to fight us through our sex life. And we said, yeah, just leave it. Let's leave it. So as chance would have it, the next day is a Catholic holiday. George lives for a gig in the province. And what are your plans tonight? I am less honest with George than he is with me. Why, I wonder? Oh, not much. Maybe I go to Dina's party this evening. Yeah, have a laid back night. That's what I'd like to do too. I am very laid back. Today I have a mission. This is my personal slutty holiday. See you tomorrow, darling. Were these pants always so tight? Shit, I have put on weight. Hold your breath. The bait is for the fish, not the fisherman. These pants were really tight. But today I'll be signaling a loud and clear yes. So I was planning how to, how to find this guy today to Dina's party this evening. If I still haven't reeled in a guy by then, I definitely find one dancing at the club tonight. He should be sexy and willing, nothing more. How complicated it is in contrast to find a man for life. It's hugely relaxing that I've already found him in George. First adjoined. This is what you do in the park. Can I join you? Ooh, that went faster than expected. So we speak English together. But <laughs> now the, we, al yeah, we already spoke English before. Unfortunately, I have to go soon to a good friend's birthday party. And I should like mimic his Nigerian accent because he's from Nigeria. So. Unfortunately, I have to go soon to a good friend's birthday party. Shoot. Would you like to come? Why not? I don't have any plans today. Also, I should change first. Would you come with me? It's not far. No problem. Our mother told us, children, leave Nigeria. There's no future for you there. I came to Vienna five years ago. Why Vienna? Both my brothers live here. I have one sister in London and another in the US. But I like Vienna best. Really? As soon as we sit down on the sofa, I'll kiss him. Or better to move closer first and bet my eyelashes? He should make the first move. Because actually, I'm really shy. It doesn't look like that, but I am. My apartment is a bit farther out, but I keep some clothes at my boyfriend's. You have a boyfriend? He's traveling. 
he wouldn't be disturbed if you let another man in his apartment. No, no, he's cool. Make yourself comfortable in the living room. I'll be there in a second. I'd rather wait here. Ah, oh, these pants are killing me. A skirt is better for fooling around anyway. Have a seat on the sofa. The sound of a key in the lock, something opening and closing the apartment door. George, I forgot something. Uh, this is Kim, we are on our way to a party. I just uh, quickly have quickly to change. Hello, hello. <clears throat> Bye darling, we are off. The sound of a door shutting itself. So this is the woman who gives the party where Kim was invited. Cheers, having a good time. Yeah, cool party. But I'd rather be making out with you in the dark corner. Kim, will you come with me, please? Ha 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 ha. I celebrated too soon. Looks like I'll have to find a new hunting ground. Psh. After a polite amount of time has passed. Hey, I'm leaving. Wait, I'll come with you. Kim, you can stay here tonight. There's enough room. That's kind of you, Claudia, but I have to be up early tomorrow. Another time. You know, you are always welcome. Ask me if I want to come with you. So this is an inner monologue. Yeah, I don't say it. It's, I say, where do you live? In the sixth district. Oh, great. Then we are going the same way. It's a lie. I am looking for an apartment. Do you know of anything? Right now, I have only a tiny place with a friend. That was also a bad surprise because I was thinking maybe I could go with him to his place. No, unfortunately. So another plan must be there. I still want to go dancing. Let's check out CP. There's always something going on there. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to go to work early tomorrow. He doesn't want me. He doesn't want me at all. What a disaster. I wasted a day. Now all that's left is the bargain bin. Should I kiss him? No, no, I have to save my face. I'm up that way. And you? Other direction to CP. You want to go dancing alone? Why not? You walk there alone at this time of the night? The club is closed during the day. Haha, <laughs> I like you. You are funny. Ah, well, I walk you with you there. I can't let you walk alone through the city at night. I walk slowly. I appreciate the company, but I often roam the city at night. I like it. You are not afraid? No. Woman alone at night? You must be afraid. Man invented that phrase to keep women at home. Bad things can happen. For example, you could get mugged. I don't have anything worth stealing. There are bad people. Yeah, yeah, that's true everywhere. Luckily, Vienna is one of the safest cities in the world. Vienna is so safe, a woman can get harassed when she wants to get harassed. <laughs> in Lagos, you can't even walk alone at night as a man. Lagos is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Please kiss me. So that was what actually was going on in my head. Ah, oh, those lips look so soft. Why doesn't he want me? Perhaps he's one of those people who won't have sex on the first date. An upstanding, respectable man who only wants respectable woman. Buff. What do you do for work? I am a metal fitter. I actually, I'm actually a mechanic, an auto mechanic, but I know my way around all kinds of machinery. Ah. We are almost there. It was nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks so much for the company. Be well, you too. 
The goodbye kiss gave me, perf gave me pretext for touching him, a short, sweet moment to remain on his cheek. And finally, mm, these lips are so soft. I'm afraid he'll leave if I let him go. There's a little park over there. Just a little while. I really should go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, let's just fool around a little bit. I am talking to him like he's a virgin. Hopefully he's not one. No, this man knows what he is doing. So I'm making a lot of noises here. There is someone. Footsteps that slowly fade away. Do you have a condom? No. No? Oh no! We can't fuck. How did I not think of condoms? It's okay. No, it isn't. Come, kiss me. Ah. And he was really good with any kinds of machinery. I mean, really, 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 really good. I mean, with his hands. I'm sorry, I didn't write it explicitly in the book, but I have to say it now because it didn't come out in the book well. Um, I think maybe I should have said it in the book. I thought it sounded cheesy when I wrote it in the book and then I didn't, but now I think I should have. Call me whenever you want, I will. So then I acted like I still go to this club. And then I went, I skipped some pages and he called again. He called again, please. And do it right this time. All too soon. So I don't know what he was doing. I think he was just sitting there depressed. I hope he was depressed. Sigh. So the next day I was sitting with George. Something crazy happened to me yesterday. Do you remember the young man, the black man who was briefly here? Yeah. I have to confess something to you. I was into him. That didn't escape me. Forgive me. For what? You don't need to apologize. Ah, George, I love you. I visited him yesterday. You were at his place. Uli, you're being safe, right? Safe? Yes, I brought condoms. I was too eager to use them. What happened? Oh my God, this man is so hot. Mm, these lips. I tell George what happened from this point on here. What do you want from me? You want sex? Yes. That was the wrong answer. Imagine that. Really? Sorry, I'm no lover boy. Are you one of those white women who only goes for black men? What? No, you are the first black person I've ever kissed. You have a boyfriend. Yeah, and? You are cheating on him. No. No, what would you call this then? I would be cheating if I was going to lie to him, but I'm not doing that. He didn't like that answer either. You hurt his pride. You white people are crazy. The whole time I kept thinking, what is the problem? I like you, you like me, let's fuck. Ah, a refreshing attitude, if only it were that easy. <sighs> then I left. That was really inexcusable. I should have stayed and talked things through. I probably really offended him with my quick exit. Upside down world. There was a time in my life when I hated men because all they wanted from me was sex. It took me a long time to see the fun in it. And now I find myself suddenly on the side of the perpetrator. I didn't want to hurt him, the opposite. 
Men always think that too. I like him. I respect him as a person. As we know, this is what men always say too, right? You left. You couldn't have expressed your intent more clearly. <sighs> Maybe it's better this way. So it was not uh, the ending of the story. He called again. We had fantastic sex. It was great. And, uh, but he was not uh, able to accept the three triple relationship. He was always longing for his one girlfriend and he wanted it from me. And I kept telling him that I am not this person. So it was, it was, it was doomed from the beginning somehow. But on the other hand, we also had some great times too. Now I want to show something totally different. Mm, I thought about doing a third autobiographic story, but unfortunately one of the protagonists uh, said, I am not allowed to tell this story. So I had to find another material for uh, comic and for comics works. And I have a second hobby that is like, I'm a history nerd or whatever. I really like to read about his prehistoric, um, history in general, because I find it super fascinating how different we humans act and react in, under different circumstances. Before I always thought, how is it possible we were somehow always the same humans, but now I know we are not always the same humans. We are so much um, um, made by, uh, we are so much the product of the culture. We are grown up that uh, people in, in, in who grew up in different cultures are really different have different ways of thinking and reacting and behaving or whatever. And, and I find it interesting to think about these historic uh, roots of our, of the world we know now, whatever. Um, what we, for example, see from prehistoric art, there is this complex of figurines which I find quite interesting because you all know it because they are the main figurines of the ice age. If you see the art of the early humans from the first 20, 15,000 years, the female figure is predominant, absolutely. You have hundred figures of a woman and one figure of a male. One figure is male, 100 are female. So I found this very interesting because it's the total opposite of the female representation in the art of the last 4,000 years where the male figure is the one, the strong and dominant one and the women are shown on the side or not shown. So I was, um, reading a lot about this matter since long time and there is the research was um, brought up a lot of new dates and there are a lot of new perspectives on on prehistoric life so i thought let me do something like an essay inspired by the first essay which i was reading to you today about uh, the research and the new perspectives of our ancestors art, because it's the art of the first, the first art of humankind. I had to start really from the beginning. Like um, I, there are like 80 pages in Africa, the mother country of all mankind. And uh, the art production of the humans started somehow with ochre, with this red color, you know? The ochre is the first trace of cultural behavior um, because it doesn't have a, a use uh, in the first moment. So this is what I talk about and I show the first findings, which are a piece of a stone where, they are this, where this pattern is carved in. It's 33,000 years old, but every age which is past 26,000 years is very, very flexible. They, can, they are not able to uh, date it really fine the very old stuff, but we can see it's really, really very, very old. And um, yeah, I talk about this stuff. Then they are 
then you see this expansion out of Africa. And, and in, the, in the images you can show, you can get an atmospheric view on historic events, which a normal author doesn't have, uh, is not able to show because he doesn't have the pictures and the narration. And uh, I want to also intertwine it with real sceneries where I start inventing somehow fictional scenes of the past. It's a new thing for me to invent this stuff, but it's super exciting. So what you have here now is uh, I skipped pages of Indonesia and of, it's just for you to see the images and they are not colored yet. The color will also be added and the new lettering will be made, which is more pretty. Uh, you know, humans were we're exiting Africa and uh, going everywhere. Yeah, we have this very small gene pool, which makes it more likely that that uh, African was the center. And um, somehow we are really very, very similar to each other despite the visual differences, but the material is really very, very near to each other. Mm, and some after like page 100 finally i come to europe and europe is ice is 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 full of ice and there is no forest and no streets and no cities and no people not even one guest house to to warm up it's a very lonesome place but a lot of animals it's also like it said there were so many animals like in a African savanna, they were shitting and the grass was growing very well on the animal feces. And you have uh, the first drawings in Spain, which are 60,000 years old, probably made by Neanderthals. So I have this cave in El Castillo, it's called, and near the cave, there is a hot spring and it seems that the animals were also bathing in the spring and that's why it was an easy hunting ground for the people because the animals were like tranquilized from the hot steam. Mm. One usual idea about uh, Stone Age is that the women were sitting at home and the men were hunting and it's really now clear that women were definitely hunting with uh, um, strings and balls and also with spears and stuff. I mean, they were just hunting. It, it's, it, it was a, a 19th century idea that women keep stay at home. Mm, I bring a lot of examples why I could say this, like uh, from Africa or from Alaska where it is known that women were hunting. And then I sh am finally, this is the scene where I'm working on now. It's near my own home country in Austria, like 50 kilometers far from where I was raised. And it was a mammoth step. The, the mammoths were living there and Mammoths are also matriarchal, you know. It seems that they were matriarchal because in Siberia, many bones were found in, um, in, in swamps or like bones of male animals which had accidents where nobody helped them out. You know, uh, if you live in a group, it's not that likely that you have an accident as if you are alone and you are an adventurous young teenage male animal who wants to um, look around what's going on there. And then suddenly he falls in the swamp and dies. So that's the only uh, indeed symptom we have which can tell us which kind of society the elephants had, the mammoths had. But because elephants are matriarchal, so we think they were also matriarchal. And that's interesting because the first society, which I'm, no, one, one, one very old society is from Czechoslovakia. And you see they have all these female figures and there are no male figures, not a lot. It's a very, very female centered society. And I find it fascinating because you would think that they are very masculine, these ice age people, because they were hunting the mammoths, you know, but no, they do all these very fine ceramics and they invented, um, 
weaving and they invented ceramics 15,000 years before uh, it came up in China again. But they only invented it for decorative reasons. They didn't do pots. And the fun thing is, it seems that they didn't even put it out of the oven. They made it, let it burn, and left it in the ashes. So it seems to have a magic background, because uh, why else would you mix clay from the river with um, bones, with smashed bones, and burn them in a very, very high degree, because you have to get a high degree that it um, survives uh, the 30,000 years which it is old. So. And when then I have these findings, you know, and then I start talking about the different aspects of these findings and, you know, the oils, what could it mean? And, ah, and here you have these figures made out of mammut toe bones and the same figures you can find from Jukshan women now and they are for birth giving women, stuff like this. So what I'm actually talking is about the role of the women in the Ice Age. And I do a lot of comparisons with um, uh, indigenous people or with ethnological um, findings to just get to just spe it's speculation. It's all speculation, of course. I can only speculate. But this is what the archaeologists are doing. Also, the more I read about archaeology, the more self-confident I get that I am also able to make a speculation because ah, what these guys speculated in the last hundred years, it's so ridiculous. It's also something I'm quoting in the book because it's funny. Yeah. So that's the project I'm working on now. And you see here that, that in, in they also found a prehistoric skull of a dog uh, here in Dolny Vestonice. And here you see an image of the archaeologists in the 19th century, which digged out the first bones, all male, of course. And, and uh, here you have the wolves, which were following the, and the hunters. So I try to mix uh, science, essay, and some epic scenes of the past. And I love this work. It's very exciting. I learn a lot. So this is the end of my lecture. We don't hear you. Oh, sorry. What's the name of that project? Oh, I don't have a name yet. Uh -huh. I don't have a name yet because it's, it's, I would like to call it also like Homo sapiens, but it's also already taken Homo sapiens, maybe. I don't know, but it's too near. OK. So if you have a question, just put your name in the chat and I'll and or unmute yourself or I'll unmute you. Do we have any questions? Anybody? No? I could say ah. something which oh. I was oh no, wait, a question, a question. Yes, please. Oh, so you came to comics, uh, you said it you thought it was an, a late age at 30. What did you think of comics when you were growing up? Did you, did you? I was not thinking that I would be able to draw so many pictures. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a lot of people. It's a lot that. of pictures. <laughs> right. Right, and drawing continuity or make, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I have yeah. so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please. But I don't want to take them all, but, but what, um, I guess I guess this is a very intense project. The last one that you showed us that you're working on that involves so much research and I love it. How how um, I guess I guess how um, how do you do the research? I mean, uh, it must be it must be lots of books, but also visiting sites and and also um, you must have. Um, books that you really enjoy or follow that that um sort of guide this the way you're thinking or is it coming I guess, yeah just talk more about it i guess yeah okay i mean the main the one very important figure is maria gimbutas you might know her she did a lot of research about the neolithic society and that was very female dominated dominated and she had a lot she had to hear a lot of discussions about her work uh, and now it's 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 very clear that uh, that the debate was just 
uh, useless, th that she was quite right with her ideas. And uh, I also, you know, Joseph Campbell is also one of, I love his writing. Mm -hmm. But then nowadays you can read a lot of uh, digging uh, reports. You can read on the research gate. I can, I can also communicate with the archaeologists, you know. I did some, I, they, you can send, you, you can read all this very boring stuff about the thousands of uh, little stones they digged out and the different forms. And then there is one little interesting uh, detail in the whole text, which I need. <laughs> uh, but, but I find it also fun. I mean, it's also like a collect hunting, you know, hunting science. <laughs> I get the hunting joy or whatever, flesh or whatever. And you can also visit sites that are nearby you if there are places that are within. Yeah, that's true. Um, I saw I, everything that is in everywhere I travel and there is some spot historically interesting. I go there and look at it. I was two times at Pompeii. I give Paul Karasik a tour through Pompeii. We had a very cool time there. Yes. Lucky. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, uh, but actually the real sites are not that efficient as the books and the, and the digging reports. Mm -hmm. They are gold. I, I really love research gate. And academia? I don't get access. Maybe I have to get the access. Maybe I don't, I didn't look for it. I didn't look for it yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I use that one a lot. I have but to. I don't, yeah, I think it's open access also. I have to try. Um, maybe I use it already. If it's open, then maybe. I did. Then I already did. But but yeah. maybe it was not that. Yeah, I don't know. It's my another question is that I, I it's so such a different project to do this kind of research than your very personal work. And yes, I know. It's it's just uh, it, maybe it's oversized. And it's a very, it's like going to Italy with no money and no idea about the geography, you know. But I actually here I know the geography very well because I read about this subject since 20 years and I'm really into it. I'm really quite well informed, well informed enough to do a simple sum summary for the uh, normal audience, you know. What mm -hmm. I, I hope that I'm able to break it down, you know. And to have a pragmatic tone which doesn't sound too spiritual it's uh, uh, that, that's a problem sometimes for the there's, for the listeners they yeah can't. there's nothing that freaks out an archaeologist more is is anything about spiritual spirituality yeah and the problem is the magic you can't uh, talk about prehistoric societies without thinking that they were be that they be left in that they believed in these magic things or these charms or whatever um, but as an artist, I have some chances mm. because, you know, the, the is, there are some similarities in artwork and um, marvel at something, you know, or creating magic or whatever. There are some, there are some options for me as a storyteller to get to grip this very, very not, not it's not a subject which you can really get, you know, because it's too too many aspects. But I, I and and I have a lot of time because I don't have the pressure of being ready with the book. Um, I think you know I have I, I'm teaching a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I want I want to get retirement money when I'm 67. That's my plan now. That's why I'm teaching now. But I also like teaching. Um, so uh, I I don't have I don't know when it will be finished. I am, I can take, it can take two years or three, maybe also one year because of the lockdown. I'm very forward now. I'm, I'm very well, I'm, I'm much more in plan than I thought, but, but I don't need to be, I don't need to be finished. I don't have a contract with a publisher, but I have publishers which want to make it. It's such a luxurious situation. Yeah. Just, it's my game project. You know, it's my, my play playground project. It's the one where I, I enjoy. And I don't have to draw any cars. No cars at all. That's the best. Uh, they haven't found an Ice Age car yet. <laughs> <laughs>
good for me, good for me, yes. <laughs> a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So one, I won't, okay, one more. Do you miss working on a personal project at the same time or do you draw personal uh, comics at the same time or, or is it completely separate? I am not drawing personal. I mean, you mean why should I draw? I mean, I mean, no. I have a diary. I don't draw personal comics for to draw about my. You know, I don't. I just draw personal comics if there's something interesting to tell. It's like not. It, I'm not this 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 type of in. Uh, you know, I have to reflect all the time and write it down, and I like this and so. No, I'm, it's more very. Uh, conscious. If I decide this is the part I tell, then I know why I do it. You know, there's a, a storyline around it. There's a dramaturgic bow. You know, it has some. Yes, and the the story I have, which would be an option, as I said, it's I'm not allowed to tell it. So, and 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 and, mm, it's so beautiful to draw the nature, and the animals. <laughs> So I don't care uh, if I'm, I mean, it's fun to draw adventures which you experienced yourself, of course. It's, it's, it's big fun, yeah. <laughs> okay. Question from Diane Tucker. Hi, thank you for the very interesting uh, conversation and for sharing so many wonderful images. Um, I think it was Ben who mentioned that you um, also important to you is actually presenting these things in digital form and I'm wondering in terms of actually the shaping of sequences whether it does tend to happen in a linear fashion or whether um, and I, I did see that um, sometimes you sort of present images and then sort of lay meta or sort of commentary around it I'm wondering if there are other ways you play with actually the form uh, and the way you actually shape shape sequences and perhaps do it in, in any ways that might not that might be unusual or something we don't see much of or Mm. This book is made for, for print. The books which I showed were all made for print. So the layout is free, is, is always for the printing pages, you know, adapted. If I would do an online comic, I might do it for Instagram and it would always have the square format. It's very boring to do online comics actually because you are, you are limited to the smallest format. The audience can see the comic and that's the, the mobile phone, which makes you draw just panel Per panel in a square format. It's super boring. I am super interested in new ways of visual storytelling with digital uh, techniques, but then in the minimal uh, format, you know, not the animation, uh, interactive, big plot. I, I think there are a lot of technically small inventions which you can use as a storyteller. You just need to explore with it. Only I made I realized that nobody pays for online comics, or it's very hard. While books are still a thing, books are still a very uh, steady, well-respected medium. If I don't, I don't really earn so much money with the books, but with lectures and stuff. But I wouldn't get the lectures and the respect with online comics. The people love the books. They if the before the today is the last day is the rest of the life was published it was published online it had some nice audience very small audience but the audience really realized what the story is or i mean they started liking the book after it was there on paper you know i got the real good feedback when the people had the object in the hand Mm, so I really think there is so much potential in digital storytelling. I am exploring it with my students, not with my own work. Because I just have not the time. You have to decide what to do, you know. And, and, and if you start with comic storytelling online, it's also you need to experiment a lot. And as I said, I, I, Electro Comics is on a break in a moment. It's still online, but I didn't upload new stories since five years, I think, because it uh, depressed me a little bit that I should do everything also for the mobile phone. That, you know, when we made Electro Comics, it, the mobile phone was no, 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 no subject. It was for the laptop, for the digital screen. And I like the PDF format. It's still a good format, actually, because it always takes the size of the screen and it's always looking good. It's just a bit, you have to download it. There's some issues, I don't know. But um, 
when I realized that the book is uh, survives quite well, I lost a little bit interest in doing in 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 using the energy to to do online comics actually. But I would love to to continue with electro comics if I find somebody who does the techniques. I don't want to make the techniques anymore. I have no time for it. And and I learned three new programs in the meantime to make websites, and they are all gone already. I have to learn a new one. I'm pissed off. I love drawing books because this technique is the same since hundred years. And I mean, it changed. The technique changed too, but but somehow it 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 looks more more uh, secure. I mean, I get old. The ages, the the, the years run like 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 wind, and my books are still there. And I learned this new technique making websites and the whole tools are ancient already. Yeah, it's strange. But why did you ask? Because um, I'm interested in playing with form and uh, and shaping different forms of narrative. I'm actually trained as an interactive designer, but um, it, I don't see that much of that work uh, around. And I and given the fact that you, you know, he mentioned and you've said that you uh, are specifically interested in digital forms and, and the affordances um, it allows, I, I just wondered, you know, what if there was uh, work of that you know, I, I was interested in understanding your approach to it. Mm. Or alternately, if, if if there if if there are people whose work you admire, I'd be interested in hearing about that too. I don't have I don't really have that digital artist. Where, I mean, I in the end I read the books. I actually it's it's super interesting to explore these uh, options with students because they have a lot of energy to make experiments, you know, and they want to try out stuff and I am the teacher and I can tell them to do it and so on. And now in the moment I have a student, he does his bachelor with a, a visual essay um, reportages and he uses a lot of these techniques which the New York Times uses a lot for their visual essays where you just scroll and there's something happen and you can do so much stuff with it and we love it. So, so we love to play around with it, yes. I hope it will be visible for the audience one day. In the moment, it's more in the art uh, school. Yeah. <laughs> Public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? What they said does her. Yes. Hi. I, um, I, since you have this quality, it feels normal to you, but you have this fearlessness. Uh, for approaching humans, like you almost see no danger. And I was wondering the roots of roots of it. Like, was your one of your parents were like that? They modeled that to you. It's a, it's such a beautiful gift. It's a good question, and I think it has to do with how I was raised. As I was beginning in the as I started, we are not the same people because. Um, I, I was not afraid because I grew up in a safe environment, you know, it was like on the countryside and I don't remember that we had, I mean, okay, we closed the doors, but I was, there, there was nothing scary. I could somehow always find somebody who helps you. I was not afraid of people and I was thinking that I would go out in the world like one of these heroes in the fairy tales and I would fight the dragon and uh, marry the prince or whatever, you know? It was really exactly like that. I was thinking if I keep a good clean heart, I will survive, you know, like in the fairy tales. Didn't happen, didn't happen. And very interesting experience I wanted to share with you is the um, response of a very, a lot of people, especially from America, that they asked me why I didn't, when I was there in Sicily, why I didn't um, go to the train station, enter the next train to Austria and go home to my parents or Vienna where I was safe. And I never thought about that when I was in Italy because, you know, I was the hero who fought the dragon and you don't go back if it gets cold or if it gets a bit tougher or whatever it's just a stupid idea to think that you just have to run home to your parents where it's safe that's not what you do as the hero and i felt like this hero too and i'm still angry that there are many many people which think that the woman has to go home 
You know, if the male hero in the story uh, experiences um, violence or whatever, uh, the audience expects him to fight. Yes, and to succeed or to lose or whatever. <laughs> they would never respect him if he just turns around and takes the next train to his parents, you know? But it's exactly what a lot of people ask me. Why didn't you do it? And they don't understand that I never thought about it. And I find it very interesting, like uh, sociology, like, like what we think that women can do and not do, you know? That was an interesting experience, which I didn't think that it might would happen. But, but the, the old, the old thinking is very, it, it, it's still in our heads. Yeah. I think uh, it's also one thing to experience these things and then a whole other level of bravery to draw them and make a story about it. No, it was fun because at home, nothing could happen to you anymore. You know, you sit on your warm table and, and I mean, it's just, ah, it was so cool to draw this story because then I, I, I mean, I already, always knew that it's somehow an interesting story, but the, the, the quality, when, you, when I started drawing it, it starts, I developed, you know, I started, I, I felt it. <laughs> it was, I, I had the author's rush of enjoying all the bad stuff because it's the best story, you know? <laughs> Robert has a question, I heard. Yes, hi. Hi, nice to see you again. Nice to see I you too. I have your book. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, this was so great. I, I thank really you. Love, I really love seeing the, the breadth of your work. And um, I, I, it, it's kind of a question. I hope it's a question. You, maybe you have an answer. Um, I feel like your work like really takes a long view of like your life or you now history. Like you have a very, you can see very far, it seems, in your work. And I'm curious, like when you put it together, um, is it a long process? Like if, have these books been in the works a long time before you actually start making them? Or are you able to just jump in and start creating? It's a long process. Um, the, the first, the, the, the book when I was 17, I mean, this, I was working on it for five years. Yes, I did two versions of the beginning. I was working on it very long time. The second autobiographic book was very fast because I was in training and it was just fun to draw autobiographic and to draw about the, you know, because I know the scenes, I don't have to do research. If you do uh, journalistic or any historic work, you have to do so much research. It's a lot of work. So I enjoyed the second autobiographic book because after 200 pages, you are just good in drawing. You know, you can just feed up your, hey, wow, I learned something. I know how to do it. It, it was just a good feeling. And now I am insecure because it's a big project, but I enjoy it in the same time. And I make the experience that it's good to wait. In the meantime, while I wait, I get new, a lot of new ideas, which I would have not had if I would have drawn the scene too fast. So in the moment I am slow in drawing because I have the university next to me, but I realized every break brought me a new discovery. So patience is also not bad. I see it now. Yes. Was this the answer to the question? I forgot it. In the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. That Good. was great. Yeah, thank you. Can I can I ask about your process? Do you draw uh, just pencil? Is there any digital? process involved um it seems I, like you're not using ink um no. but i don't know yeah I, I, would, I would love to use ink because it's much more clean and 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 and, and contrasty you know than the pencil but i love the smooth touch of the pencil on the paper mm, the color is made digital in the end or it will be made digital in the end but uh, the work on paper is just great I think I get, I'm, if, if I'm on the computer, mm, the concentration is a different one. The, the, the computer has some wipe, which somehow makes you less relaxed or something. I find it more relaxing to work on the drawing table. And I think it has to do with the electronics. The young people, they have no options. They, are, they need to draw on the computer, but I don't. So I'm happy about that. 
And I'm so happy that I still have images to hang on the walls. Wow. Can I ask another one? Yes, I mean. <laughs> We're not going too long. When um, your, the, your first book, did you have a publisher while you were working on that? You no. were just working on it knowing that you wanted to make this book. <laughs> um, I didn't know that, no, no, but my, I knew that I wanted to draw comics and I wanted to make a long book because I don't like short stories. I had the feeling that I want to have a big, I wanted to longer story. I don't know, I wanted to spend, I'm a novel reader. That's why, because I was not socialized with comics. I was socialized with novels and novels were always big and I love big books. So I wanted to draw a comic with which you can spend minimum two hours, four hours, you know, not this one hour you have read it took. So, um, and, uh, but I had also, I was too old for the graphic uh, designer job. I was not really good in this. I could have, I, I studied graphic design. Yeah, I could have also worked in the agency, but with uh, 35, it's difficult in a design world. They don't really want you. And I was not really interested. I love drawing comics. So my second plan was maybe, I don't know. I saw myself selling vegetables actually when I was drawing this book. I had this horror idea that I was, I will always just keep doing these fucking secondhand job, you know, these student jobs like in the cafe, selling the cafe, or this, where these shitty paid jobs, which are no fun. Now I have a shitty paid job, which is actually really fun, you know? And that was my dream. It came true. <laughs> No, I mean, the teaching is paid well in Germany. I don't, I really don't need to complain. But, but at that time I, I was, I was having the only, that I knew that I can be good in comic storytelling, but the publishers thought that my drawings are not that interesting. They didn't like that so much. They wanted to be uh, overwhelmed by the visuals the first moment they opened the book. And if it doesn't happen, then they think the potential uh, buyer also closes the book. So the, the, the policy was to, yeah. So, so I was not so successful in the beginning, but the, 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 on the other hand, the, the, the scene is very small in Germany. So we knew each other and there was some contact and with the journalistic work, I got some attention. Um, I worked three years and then the, after three years, the uh, Avant Verlag said that they want to print it. But still he was, before it came out, he started thinking, well, ah, maybe we make it next year. I don't know. You know, it was, <laughs> mm. uh, but I mean, that's the problem. If you start that, that's the shitty situation. If you are a starter, you are not good enough yet for that people really like you and uh, you have to risk everything, you know, but you have to continue to come somewhere. So, yeah, the, maybe that's something very important for comic artists to be consistent, not to have this long breath or whatever. How, I don't know the word in English now. Yeah. To not give up so fast. <laughs> Are you still doing any children's books? No, no, it's boring. Children <laughs> books are boring. I mean, I like children very much. I love to observe them, but I'm super happy that they go home with somebody else. That's great. And to do children books, it's boring because the publishers are quite boring. You have very few options of stories you can tell. It always has to be the, you know, they, they, they make the books for the parents which buy them. They don't make them for the children. Mm, this, the market is totally dense. If you do children books, bah, you, you don't earn a lot of money. You, you no, it's, I think it's worse than comics. I think they suffer more, the children book illustrators. And uh, I find it much more interesting to tell stories for adults because you can be more sharp. Also uh, the sex. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to appear in every story. That's true. But if you tell stories for children, you always have to be saying, yeah, no, no, it has to be so nice, you know, and sweet. And I find it interesting that, I mean, for we, we adults, we know that there's also some bittersweet <laughs> stuff interesting. I did children books for my own son, you know, Mark. And now he's adult. Now I can do adult comics. I know. It's the middle of the night for Uli. Three o'clock. Oh my God. Okay. So thank Gosh. you for that amazing <laughs> talk. For me, it's tomorrow already. It's so funny. Yeah. Isn't it great? For you, it's today. It, For me, it's tomorrow. It's did cool. anything happen? In the, in yeah. Groundhog no. Day is over there. No, it's just dark outside. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Thank you. It was great. Great. Talk. Thank you for the invitation. I feel super honored. It was ah. really nice to be invited. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Kelly and, Flo. Um, Thank you, Kelly. Tan Tana, hello, Tana. <laughs> I know these people. Joe, I know Joe, right? Is it Joe Ullman? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Bye. Take Sarah, care. I know Sarah Good from night. Switzerland. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a familiar round. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. I, I will say bye bye too. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Bye to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Oli. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to see you.